Hello, and uh, thank you for uh, joining this, um, this session. Uh, my name is Joost Beunerman. It's a real uh, pleasure to be uh, presenting uh, this to you, uh, albeit uh, through a pre-recording. Uh, I'm part of an organization called Dark Matter Laboratories, and we have uh, worked together um, extensively with uh, UNDP, uh, amongst many other uh, international organizations, uh, on the topic of framing our innovation efforts in the context of the cascading global risks and complex system challenges uh, that we face. Um, because we need to ensure that whatever we think of as innovation um, is uh, relevant in the current global and uh, local context uh, that we're facing. And I'll say a little bit uh, more about that in a moment. Um, uh, the, the following slides will be uh, shared with you afterwards. Uh, some of them are relatively text heavy, but uh, they can be uh, translated uh, so you have material to look at afterwards. And here you see uh, the various topics we're uh, going to cover in the next uh, 20 uh, minutes or so. Um, and uh, much of this work comes out of um, uh, work, like I said, we've been doing with the uh, UNDP Executive Office, which was, um, uh, for example, summarized in a document that we created uh, in the midst of the, the first year of the uh, global uh, COVID pandemic called A Way Forward. And it really talked about how we can govern in an age of emergence, of a continuously um, emerging new and existing and deepening and uh, interconnected uh, risks that we're facing at global as well as local level. And um, perhaps, um, you know, the most important thing to say is that uh, because of these deep interdependencies, the changes that we need to make as, uh, as public sector innovators um, and as uh, uh, people in a wider ecosystem collaborating with the public sector is that, that the changes uh, we need to make are going to have to evolve uh, as our, so many of our um, living systems are transitioning. And we face uncertainty as well as risk. We don't know uh, how um, the, the, the current issues that, that we're, we're facing in our urgent everyday life will uh, evolve over the next year. Unexpected events happen, and the last uh, years and even months are very clearly uh, evidence of that. So, uh, so the systems in which we operate need to uh, adapt in relation to this deep uncertainty um, and this interconnectivity between uh, different uh, risks. Um, so we need to think both uh, long term and uh, and in the immediate term in terms of the innovation capacity we create in uh, response to this. And so the most obvious ones, and I'm, I'm, I won't spend a huge amount of time uh, talking about each of these ones, but for example, um, uh, climate change. Right? We know the enormous risk we're facing and are already experiencing. Um, and uh, of course, in local situations, this is frequently intertwined with things that are perhaps um, more tangible to us in the everyday, like air pollution, and it's part of the same system risks. And we know um, that uh, increasingly um, the populations in our territories will be acutely vulnerable to um, these impacts. And um, uh, uh, this year's IPC report uh, came uh, out um, and, uh, for example, a key risk being heat and uh, drought stress uh, on uh, on crops and on our food systems. And if you um, if you really uh, acknowledge how much of this is already going on and how uh, the geopolitical events of the last weeks are, uh, are interconnecting with that, we just know that we cannot take our, um, our uh, so something as core as our uh, key um, food crop supplies for granted. Uh, prices uh, will increase, are already increasing. That has cascading effect on the basic security of our populations um, and that in turn might drive um, political events as well. So, so again, we are now living in an age where these abstract, seemingly distant uh, issues like uh, global warming are becoming very, very real and immediate and interconnected with other crises can lead to rapid, unpredictable runaway events. And 
being in the public sector, we have to uh, uh, enable ourselves to build agile responses for that. And in the public sector, we cannot do that just on our own. We have to work together um, with other innovators, with the private sector, with higher education, with uh, with disruptive innovators and multilateral organizations. That much is clear. Because again, and this is how we see a bit, uh, here's a risk map that we created for the city of Edinburgh in Scotland around the time of the, um, of the pandemic. And if you, if you look into it in more detail, um, I won't have time to go into it uh, too much, you see that each piece of um, uh, of the puzzle is always uh, connected to so many others. Livelihoods, supply chains, um, uh, family uh, and household finances, um, our, uh, our capacity to, uh, to be uh, innovative and to, to support innovative startups, um, the, the risks in the everyday uh, environment around core um, human safety, etc. These are all connected and each risk uh, uh, can, can always make the other one worse. And, and that's why um, our, um, our system is currently uh, best characterized as that uh, age of emergence and age of emergency. Now add to that things like biodiversity loss. Again, it's, uh, it may not be um, uh, always as tangible in the everyday life, but the impacts are enormous, right? And, and you see the stats here on the slides. All the mammals on Earth, um, only 4% are now wild animals. Um, and, um, and, and the loss of biodiversity um, will make us more vulnerable in the, uh, in the face of climate change and other uh, um, events because it actually acutely decreases our resilience. And that matters uh, so much over the next decades. And, uh, and uh, again, in the public sector, we have to be able to have better answers to what that means. Um, pandemics and uh, their uh, related uh, impacts on, uh, again, uh, the health system, on household uh, finances, on uh, long-term prospects for, for learning, et cetera. And again, it's, it's, it's not just us who's saying it. Uh, the Secretary General himself said, of course, that, that these events are also wake-up calls that, that prompt us uh, um, to think about ways of working differently. Because as the uh, Way Forward document um, uh, already uh, put it in 2020, normal, the, 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 the business as usual scenario was a problem already in the first place because key trends like, um, like inequality, um, like, um, like corruption, um, et cetera, were already in place, right? So um, uh, what, what we are very strongly posing is that we've become over the last two, three years, tragically aware of a new class of risks but they only serve to highlight what was uh, already uh, mounting up and building up across our societies in the first place. So add to that, for example, the runaway technologies of our age and um, the risk they pose uh, to, um, well, the, of course they pose a lot of opportunities as well, but they also create uh, potential vulnerabilities. And what we're seeing structurally is that the public sector struggles in being anticipatory with regards to uh, these critical vulnerabilities. Right? Um, uh, we see that it's hard to anticipate uh, what uh, might come our way. What do we need to regulate for? What infrastructures do we uh, need to build? Um, and again, unless we provide strong answers uh, to this, uh, we will fail to safeguard um, the future. So, so cybercrime is just one example of, uh, of how this is already playing out, costing um, tens, even hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and these are not just financial costs, they, they are also costs that, um, th that that's basically a threat in our mental well-being and the very fabric of trust that societies um, are, uh, are built on. And then, of course, we have demographic issues as well, with the great demographic slowdown, the aging of our population, uh, and uh, migration, um, which of, of course you are very well um, aware of. Um, and uh, again, these manifest themselves uh, together um, in, uh, in many localities, making it very hard to see 
what um, uh, sustainable and thriving futures look like. So <clears throat> those are just a few of the examples uh, of uh, the risks that we face and, and the why uh, of innovation. We need to provide better answers to the interlocking challenges uh, of our age. A and if we don't do that, okay, we risk as public sector leaders um, to become uh, irrelevant. And, and this graph sums that up quite nicely. If our current practice only improves gradually, or if it improves at all, but the strategic risks be, um, accelerate uh, more and more, as indeed they do. And this is not a hypothetical scenario. This is what is happening across the world. Um, um, we risk becoming less and less relevant to the magnitude of the challenge. And that is a, a core issue with regards to uh, our legitimacy, uh, uh, your legitimacy um, uh, in uh, your uh, local situation vis-a-vis um, uh, the citizens uh, and companies and what they rightly expect um, expect of the public sector. So there's a very clear reason why we need to take this extremely seriously. If we don't take this seriously, um, we risk becoming uh, irrelevant to the world. So this transition and this need for innovation calls for a revision of our relationship with the economy thinking of how we assign value to, to certain uh, contributions uh, over time. It has, it has to, co uh, to contribute to addressing these long-term risks. Um, uh, a, a revision of a relationship with the environment, really um, recognizing our interdependency and the increasing in, in the sheer in, inhabitability of en our environment, of certain places, whether because of flood or because of a continuous drought and fire risk might become uh, inhabitable or, for example, uninsurable. Um, and lastly, uh, our relationship with our society, really understanding uh, that big uh, demographic slowdown. So this requires us to think of new pathways for innovation, right? And really thinking in terms of strategic innovation options, uh, uh, ways in which we can chart a path forward uh, in this great um, uh, uncertainty. And <clears throat> one thing that, that means is that there's an inherent limitation in seeing a country purely as a bounded territory. Of course, political boundaries matter, right? But when we think of the constant flows of goods in and out of a country impacting the economy and the environment, um, uh, sometimes uh, uh, these boundaries are, um, are less relevant. So as we um, uh, set out these five strategic shifts for a new way forward. Um, uh, keep that in mind, in particular here. So um, the 21st century country or nation um, has so many uh, uh, flows in and flows out that, um, that uh, ultimately determine the degree to which uh, uh, thriving, human thriving and uh, um, uh, ecosystem survival in terms of natural ecosystem is ensures. Uh, we have to think through uh, uh, where our services come from, but also where our ideas come from, of course, also where our finance comes from and how we enable uh, sustainable uh, innovation ecosystem through the people um, that, that make up that ecosystem. Uh, and we need to uh, in increasingly really understand uh, waste um, and environmental degradation, not just as an inevitable byproduct of economic growth, but actually as something that threatens that long-term uh, economic growth. Uh, because without that, we cannot create a sustainable perspective on uh, our future. Um, and um, uh, again, a little bit more detail on that here that you can uh, read afterwards. But the real point is that uh, uh, we can no longer have a one-to-one -one action reaction uh, response to deal with the risk. We need to see uh, uh, all these elements as a network approach. And what that means is that in the context of uncertainty, we have to build towards a system that, uh, that uses the idea of anti-fragility, right? that can actually become stronger through shocks. Uh, that can rapidly adjust, uh, learn, and grow in this age of emergency. Right? 
uh, we can't just be obsessed, even though my presentation has been about this, just to be obsessed with risks. Yeah? Of course, we need to uh, really develop that safe space and, 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 uh, and ensure social justice for our inhabitants. Uh, but we also need to think about how we can um, manage these risks and ultimately move towards greater potential, the full human, technological and ecological uh, development uh, potential. Uh, so that we don't just bounce back from shocks, but uh, genuinely improve um, uh, over um, over the long time and and thrive in uncertain environments. And often, what that means is that we uh, need to think about our innovation efforts in terms of a portfolio. Right? Given the amount of uncertainty, we can't just bet everything on one or two single interventions. Um, and this is an example of what that portfolio thinking might look like. In this case, it's actually about mental health um, in Sweden. And Sweden is a high um, cognitive functioning and high uh, economic value economy. Um, and, um, and mental well-being and mental health is actually one of the key risks they face because uh, we all know that you cannot be uh, creative uh, uh, in conditions where your mental health is not uh, is not assured. So, so a country like Sweden has all interest in figuring out not just one or two, but a multitude of interventions to improve mental health. And in your context, um, given the, the the risks and challenges and opportunities that you face, um, you will also have to create portfolios of um, of interventions uh, that can uh, help you discover more about what viable pathways to a thriving future are. So thinking of your innovation effort as um, developing portfolios uh, is going to be critical. And of course, UNDP has um, has really grown this practice right across its uh, global network and is very well able to support uh, countries with developing these innovation portfolios. And this is just another way of, of showing that portfolio, but, but then over time, huh? if the options over time are you know, unknown and, uh, and, and, and growing uh, forever, uh, that means that it is our role right now, um, uh, starting from where we are on the left, um, with what is known and to do sense making about the possible options and the possible pathways towards a better future and then align our investments and our networks um, and our research and our international collaborations, etc to those promising pathways. That is the way um, to make sense of un uncertainty and to step by step build towards a better future. And of course, that is hard, right? That requires um, working with tools and frameworks that you may already have or you may not have. And it's also uh, your role, of course, and our role to support you with, um, and UNDP's role, to support you with the kind of tools that enable this high-level story that I'm telling to become operational and uh, practical. So a third factor is that in uh, the context of uncertainty, this level of innovation cannot be driven by the public sector alone. It happens in coalitions where a range of actors, citizens, civic groups, um, uh, the private sector, uh, uh, disruptive young innovators, uh, at, uh, universities, etc., can all together contribute and therefore be custodians to a future generation. No one can overcome these issues uh, by themselves. That everyone knows, right? That's an obvious point to make. But steering towards these multi-actor uh, coalitions that can really help a multi-actor um, innovation effort is probably one of your main roles, right? And so practically, we've, we've listed a few points of, uh, of what this includes and the case studies of um, public sector innovation from the UK also show this, right? The UK's um, uh, digital infrastructure became better at the moment where they recognized they had to bring in people from the private sector, tech, tech entrepreneurs and others to work in a different way and, uh, and to give them the freedom to come up with the best possible approaches. Right? Um, you cannot do this if you think you have to do it all yourself alone. 
And it also means, of course, that your, your, your citizen participation uh, needs to be in sync with that. Huh? We don't do citizen participation just to get a, um, a, a narrow level of, uh, of consent um, uh, about policy. We also do it because we genuinely need the creativity, uh, the, um, the drive, and even the investments of citizens towards uh, this better future. Uh, genuinely, in the current situation, neither the public sector nor the private sector nor citizens themselves can do this uh, can do this alone in terms of responding to risk and, and new ways of working together are critical. No matter how hard this can be, collaboration is uh, the name of the game and we need to build frameworks for that to be real and understood by everyone. And transitioning um, to what's sometimes called the donut of uh, ecological and social um, uh, safety and security is critical. I won't spend too much time on this because I know that Tim Taylor's presentation is uh, also about this, but this is a really practical framework of bringing uh, in, in one uh, visual reference, both uh, our planetary boundaries and our social needs. Um, and uh, that's something we can go uh, deep, uh, deeper into, uh, uh, perhaps together in discussion as well. And to us, what this means is that we have to embrace what we would call the boring revolution. Um, because we know that uh, any modern state uh, is to a large degree underpinned by uh, bureaucracy, not in the negative sense, but, but the, um, the, the machinery of uh, the government at local level, at uh, regional level, at national level. Now, we know that new technologies are revolutionizing uh, that bureaucracy. The systems that we take for granted, that we've used for decades, um, can change and will have to change. And often that means that we cannot just design within the rules, but actually that we have to redesign the rules themselves to remold that technological revolution towards what the key aims of our country are. Deep growth, sustainable growth, uh, socially just growth, participative growth, um, and, uh, and, and growth that really supports human flourishing. So that means practically taking the role of, of boring things like regulation, procurement, new forms of financing, and contracting much more seriously. And without embracing that boring, often invisible side um, of innovation, without taking that much more seriously, we are limiting ourselves to what we can achieve. And just to give you one example, we often talk about nature-based solutions in the context of uh, adapting to climate change, uh, for example, and to just making our cities more livable. But, but right now, we have been seeing over the last years in the UK that uh, cities are actually um, cutting down uh, some of their uh, most valuable, their, their oldest trees. And here you see an example of this happening in Sheffield. And there's enormous amounts of police there, all these people in high vis vests. Why? Because, of course, residents uh, hated and uh, are, are protesting. So why are we cutting down trees when we know how much um, importance they have uh, for keeping our cities livable? Well, it's because the, the bureaucratic frameworks we use are not fit for purpose because big trees are often seen as a cost on the municipal balance sheet, not as an asset because you have to maintain them. They can, um, they can fall down on cars, um, etc. And so we value them in the wrong way. We see them exclusively as cost, but not as part of an investment um, for a livable future in terms of air pollution, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of water retention capacity. Right. So, so this is just a practical example. Unless we see trees in a different way in our government framework, we limit ourselves to what um, to what we can do. And um, and Dark Matter Laboratories is working on this project called trees as infrastructure that enables greater investment in nature so that um, uh, not just carbon sequestration is achieved, but also new business models, new ways of achieving economic growth, new jobs, um, uh, etc. So in sum, there's a range of strategic principles that we need to think about that can guide the systemic innovation needed for the transitions uh, of our time. Long-termism, which is all about creating options for ourselves, creating coalitions that can explore and invest in uh, different uh, future pathways, and a social covenant, right? a, a contract with our citizens that can 
uh, scaffold deep changes and be resilient in the face of disruptions. But also humility, uh, humble governance is a concept initiated by Demos, uh, an organization from Helsinki in Finland, that really says we need to move beyond that culture of infallibility uh, in which the public sector is always right to acknowledging that we simply don't have all the answers yet, but that we can get to better answers together um, in more collaborative ways. It requires humility and honesty about that. And then again, innovation happening through ecosystems. And we need to invest often in these ecosystems now. That's often the place where we can start is to say, what are the coalitions that we can make um, with, uh, with local universities, um, with private sector partners, with startups, with perhaps um, uh, uh, sort of networks of, of young civic techies um, who have phenomenal levels of expertise and drive and a desire to get involved but to make these systemic collaborative arrangements that ultimately make more innovation possible. Um, and again, it's, that's, that's uh, not just about the private sector. The private sector plays a role, uh, a very important role, but also about civic society. We need to enable ourselves to continuously learn in uncertainty, not just to, uh, your capacity to plan for things now, but to anticipate and deal with uh, the future unknowns. And finally, we need to think about, about finance and contracting. If we want to go for deep growth, not just whatever creates jobs tomorrow, but what will still create jobs in um, the near future, we have to develop our learning ability. Oops, um, my slides run ahead of me. And that requires um, these five things, right? Sense making of the now, imagining the future, uh, forms of decision making that are in sync with that ways of experimenting um, uh, and taking risks with that and learning uh, and developing. And, and again, we don't want to pretend that we have all the answers either. Um, uh, a lot of this is about us together uh, discussing a series of questions. How can we build the shared uh, frameworks for this? And uh, um, these uh, questions um, you, can, you can read uh, afterwards, I won't go through each of them in detail, but again, no one can do this alone. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of open questions about how best to do this. Now, finally, this can be daunting, right? Um, and the question often arises, so, so, so what roles do we really need to take as public sector? Um, and uh, in a separate presentation, I'll go into this in a little bit more, uh, more detail, because each of you, in whatever role you're playing, um, uh, perhaps you're an elected uh, politician, uh, perhaps you are in a um, senior national government situation, perhaps you're in a senior local government situation, or you might uh, work directly with teams that deliver services um, uh, in, uh, in the everyday life of, uh, of cities and rural areas. Each of you can play a different role and understanding those roles and understanding how you personally relate to innovation potential uh, is incredibly important. And we'll uh, speak a little bit more about that uh, in a separate presentation. For now, uh, thank you very much. I hope this was helpful. Bye-bye.